mm -hmm. cultural and political mm -hmm. context. Absolutely. Welcome to Behind the Pages. Christian Appiah is with us today. Christian is a professor of history at UMass Amherst. He is also the author of several books on the Vietnam War. He is here today to talk about American Reckoning. This is a book that looks at the Vietnam War and how it changed our national identity as basically as the good guys, um, which we no longer uh, thought that we were, and how our politicians have failed to learn from the mistakes made in the Vietnam War in our subsequent conflicts, and especially in the conflicts in the Middle East. Welcome, Christian. Thanks, Diane. Nice to be here. Uh, let's start by having you uh, tell us a little bit more about your book. Uh, what made you decide to write this particular book? Well, it was my feeling, having taught the subject for decades, really, mm -hmm. in various colleges, that we really had not yet had anything like a full reckoning of what mm -hmm. we did in and to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and had, in the decades since the war, really either forgotten or distorted mm -hmm. uh, r really the depth of the violence that we did there. And uh, many Americans really had no idea even of how many Vietnamese died in the war. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember coming across some poll that showed that um, some Americans thought that maybe 100,000 Vietnamese had oh. died, but in, in fact, we're now pretty sure it was at a minimum 2 million. That's a conservative yeah. estimate, but yeah. most people are now thinking 3 million, which is just extraordinary. Yeah, and a lot of them were women and children, too. They right. weren't all soldiers. Right. So yeah. if, we, if you could imagine a Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, uh, mm -hmm in a war that where, where we lost a, a proportionate number of our mm -hmm. own population, yeah. it would have had to it'd have to include something like 20 million names. And mm -hmm. as you point out, half those names, roughly, would mm -hmm. be the names of women and children and yeah. older men, civilians. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. yeah, it was an effort to really, I, I thought we really needed to recover uh, a few things. We had a, one thing we'd also forgotten, I think, is how in the 1950s, mm -hmm. in the early 60s, really the heyday of American exceptionalism, this mm -hmm. idea of national superiority, this idea that we are forever and uh, always an invincible and virtuous force mm -hmm. for good in the world, as you say, the good guys of world yeah. history always on the side of democracy and freedom, how powerful that was mm -hmm. and how widely held. And, and, and without understanding and recovering that memory, I think it's hard to understand just how powerful Mm -hmm. the, the kind of national identity crisis that the 60s brought on, not just mm -hmm. because of Vietnam, lots of other things, lots mm -hmm. of other ferment uh, of, that, of yeah. that time, but the well, Vietnam's well, at the center yeah. of a lot uh, of that. I mean, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, what, you know, wh where did Americans get this idea that we were so exceptional? Well, it, it goes very deep in mm -hmm. our history, really all the way to the beginning that we were, the re were yeah. really even providentially or divinely blessed with this mm -hmm. mission to spread uh, our first Christian, but then also democratic virtues across mm -hmm. the continent and, and into the world. So, but I do think the experience of World War II amplified yeah. that that sense of confidence and um, and really kind of global mission, which which had an idealistic underpinning and and was shared by many uh, liberal Democrats as mm -hmm. well as conservative Republicans. Um, one of the figures that I write about in the book, who's now long forgotten but who was famous in the 1960s mm -hmm. is a guy named Tom Dooley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you remember him, but uh, he died in 1961 yeah. at 34 of cancer. That's one of the reasons he's been forgotten. And people might remember a song called Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley by the Kingston yeah. Trio, but that had nothing to do with this Tom Dooley. <laughs> in any case, I was wondering in, that any, actually, yeah. in, in any case, Tom Dooley uh, became famous with a, a best-selling book called mm -hmm. Deliver Us From Evil. Mm -hmm. which of course is, comes from the Lord's Prayer, but the, uh, it was really a kind of um, a story about how Christian compassion among Americans could go to a place like Vietnam mm -hmm. and rescue these poor, desperate um, refugees from northern Vietnam and mm -hmm. take them on Navy ships. He was part of that operation called Passage to Freedom mm -hmm. uh, into the what was then called Free South Vietnam to help them establish a democratic country. And it r really, it reads now as a great way into that culture of the 1950s. It's, mm -hmm. it, it really is a form of br quite brilliant propaganda. Yeah, yeah. And it includes uh, these horrible stories about communists supposedly jamming 
chopsticks into the ears of young Catholic school children yeah, as they because learned, they were trying to practice catechism. religion. Yeah. yeah, because they were, and uh -huh. you know, e even the government was skeptical of these stories and secretly mm -hmm. kind of investigated and could find no co you know, no evidence that any of this happened. But of mm -hmm. course, they didn't tell the public that because no. it was so effective in selling mm -hmm. selling the policy. So, yeah, Americans. Um, uh, broad, broadly supported that there was no why not it, sa it sounded mm -hmm. good and there was right. no really com very few sources of critical information mm -hmm. uh, but but slowly uh, and surely those things did get exposed in, in the 60s through you know small magazines mm -hmm. college teach-ins debate and as it became clearer that um, how violent the war was and and also the obvious fact that this this government we were supporting in South Vietnam was not a democracy at all, but mm -hmm. a kind of police state. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. absolutely, and, and the Vietnam provoked a, a real national, you know, identity crisis as we, as we started to talk about. I, I can, um, I, in a way that other wars really hadn't. Can you explain this? I mean, why was that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that anti-war dissent was unprecedented in our history. I no, mean, that's you, existed, you know, yeah. E even going back to our revolution, there were roughly a third of the people didn't want that. Mm -hmm. 1812, New England nearly seceded. Yeah. Uh, war against Mexico had uh, opposition. So there is mm -hmm. a long tradition uh, of anti-war activism, but nothing on the scale yeah. uh, of the Vietnam War era. And I. I, I think, again, it, it really um, has a lot to do with the, um, the shocking revelations th yeah. that, um, that came with a huge disparity of the most powerful industrialized war machine in world history mm -hmm. uh, wrecking havoc on a small, poor agricultural nation 10 mm -hmm. miles away. And so the thought of these gigantic, for example, these gigantic B-52 bombers that we yeah. built in the 1950s to drop hydrogen bombs mm. were refitted uh, to hold conventional bombs, 30 tons for on each plane, uh, and, 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 and engaging in a uh, kind of carpet bombing, which would just sort of destroy mm -hmm. whole swaths uh, more than a mile long and a half mile wide. Uh, in South Vietnam, that's where B-52s yes. were used. And right. you know, I, I really go out of my way in this book to remind mm -hmm. people or inform people mm -hmm. uh, what is not widely known, which is that most of the bombing that we did occurred on the country we claimed to be protecting from communist mm -hmm. aggression. Right. Um, we did bomb, we bombed North Vietnam too, but yes. four times more bombs on uh -huh. the South than on the North, and much more indiscriminate. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who still say we didn't really try to win that war. Mm -hmm. Remember, Reagan famously said that we denied our troops permission to win. Mm -hmm. yes. George Bush Sr. said that we fought with one hand tied behind our backs. Mm -hmm. And the one grain of truth in that argument is that, you know, it is true we didn't bomb North Vietnam into the Stone Age the mm -hmm. way we had the cities of Japan during World War II, all mm -hmm. that firebombing of mm -hmm. 66 cities, yes. or even North Korea, mm -hmm. where we did an enormous amount of bombing in, mm -hmm. in the north. It's not to underestimate the damage we did in North yeah. Vietnam. I mean, it was it was serious, but we didn't we didn't uh, completely level Hanoi or Haiphong, mm -hmm. though there was serious bombing in the, at, toward the end under under Nixon. Right. In any case, uh, the reason was a, a pretty obvious one. President Lyndon Johnson was very concerned that if the bombing in the north um, was too intense, uh, it might induce the Chinese to enter the war on the mm -hmm. side uh, of the communist forces in Vietnam, as they had during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. So he, he really did kind of micromanage the air war in the north, mm -hmm. not in the south. In the south, uh, even our rules, our basic rules of engagement uh, allowed American forces to call in airstrikes on villages really if they had only shown some signs of uh, giving any aid at all, okay. food or intelligence mm -hmm. to Viet Cong. We would right. drop these propaganda leaflets yeah. and say, you know, if you help the enemy, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, we'll, bomb, we'll, we'll destroy your village just as we've destroyed, and they would name 20 other villages that they've just destroyed. Mm -hmm. But of course, it wasn't really much of a choice for these 
Vietnamese villagers. No, to, because you, most of them weren't involved in. Right, either you they know, weren't or, involved, or you, you yeah. know, they may have supported the yeah. Viet Cong, or if they if they didn't and wanted to stay neutral, how are they going to themselves manage right. to keep their village free? Uh, of right. These, uh, how can they communicate their right. sort of? Right. Um, yeah, their political their philosophy. Their, you know. Yeah. yeah, or whatever there yeah. there was. Um, I mean, it basically. The Amer when it became clear, I think, to more to the majority of the American public that the, the pretenses for which we were told we were going in were false. Yeah. I mean, I think that that caused a lot of surprise amongst people who, prior to that, trusted yes, their public right. officials, didn't they? Yeah. Well, yes. And mm -hmm. the you know polls indicate that up to about 1965, the, mm -hmm. the moment where almost exactly 50 years ago today, mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson massively escalated the. The, the number of troops and and the bombing, mm -hmm. uh, polls showed that roughly three quarters of the American public trusted the government to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And with uh, by the end of the Vietnam War, that had declined to about a third, and it really has stayed there. So there was yeah. this real profound sense of betrayal uh, mm -hmm. by by the government, and mm -hmm. and as you say, it it really had to do with the the stark contrast between how the war was officially justified and explained and the realities that became every day mm -hmm. more obvious. And for people who don't know, do you, what, 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 how was that explained to the public? Why were we there? Well, um, uh, there were a couple of arguments. One was mm -hmm. the domino theory uh, mm -hmm. that uh, communism is aggressive and global force. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the 50s, it was often talked about as a global conspiracy masterminded from the Kremlin and the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. Uh, in the 60s, it wasn't quite so crude, but it was nevertheless suggested to us that mm -hmm. um, our own national security is at stake because if one country falls to communism, an, its neighbor would fall and, and so on and, and mm -hmm. increasingly uh, um, put us in peril. The other thing, too, was that we, the sort of more positive spin is that we were going to spread and def uh, defend democracy. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the ways that lie got, dis got exposed is uh, even President Dwight Eisenhower admitted in his 1963 memoir mm -hmm. that um, we blocked elections. Yes, I was going to say <laughs> there, that. Yes. There were supposed to have yeah. been democratic elections mm -hmm. in 1956 to reunite Vietnam under one government. Mm -hmm. um, the Geneva Accords that helped resolve the end of the brutal eight-year French end of China war when, mm -hmm. when, when the Vietnamese revolutionaries defeated French colonial rule. Mm -hmm. This conference determined that there should be a, a temporary compromise, which would 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 would, div would divide the country, but only for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then there would be these elections. Well, we blocked them along with the government we were supporting under No Dinh Yeah, for the reason for, for what the, reason? Uh, for the, and here, here's the key reason. Yeah. The reason is that every intelligence report Eisenhower had indicated that Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader in Vietnam, mm -hmm. would almost certainly win by in a landslide, maybe mm -hmm. 80 percent of the vote, mm -hmm. and not just in the north, but in, in the, the south, south. As, as well. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 that being the case, you know, one can understand why the Vietnamese who wanted to rid their country of any f mm -hmm. uh, outsiders mm -hmm. uh, might be forced to take up arms to get mm -hmm. rid of the government they perceived as and sort of the neo-colonial proxy mm -hmm. of the United States, a kind of puppet regime, uh, and, a, and a Catholic one to boot in a population where the Catholics represented only about five or ten percent of the population, yeah. and, and a Catholic regime that was discriminating against mm -hmm. everybody else. Mm -hmm. Thus the famous photograph that so graphically captured the world's attention of a Buddhist monk mm -hmm. uh, on a street corner mm -hmm. in Saigon, 1963, uh, setting himself on fire uh, as a sacrifice in protest to that American-backed uh, government. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I mean these things emerge, and then then I think Americans became increasingly aware of the brutal and indiscriminate nature of the warfare, mm -hmm. which put uh, exposed the claim that we were there as defenders and saviors. Mm -hmm. uh, we seemed to, and, and this there was this famous wartime line. Uh, in which an American officer uh, was dis explaining why it is that we had completely annihilated this village down in the Mekong Delta, yeah. a town really called Bin Tre, mm -hmm. where pro probably a thousand civilians were killed. Uh, this was during the uh, Tet Offensive, when our our really uh, massive counteroffensive yeah. to try to drive the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese out of these cities. 
we leveled a lot uh, of populated areas. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a journalist asked this major, well, you know, what, hap what happened right. here? What, and he what said, are we doing? Yeah. it became necessary to destroy the town in order to save it. Yes. And, and, and this obviously exposed, uh, you know, what does that mean? It's so contradictory on mm -hmm. its face. Um, Anti-war presidential candidate, Senator Robert Kennedy, yeah. actually made use of that statement and, and, and I think smartly extrapolated if we we're going yeah. to destroy all of South Vietnam in order to save it, why are we there in the first place? Right, right. Uh, and, you know, and of so course he was assassinated. Of course he was assassinated. Yeah, a few months later. 68, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, despite the damage that has been done, um, w was done by the Vietnam, our, our national image by the Vietnam War, um, are politicians still try to promote this idea that we are defending democracy? Can you, do you want to go into that a little bit? Because I think that's one of the links you wanted to make in your book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the, the remarkable thing is mm -hmm. that um, while the war generated massive opposition to the point where by 1971, 58% of Americans, a full majority, said they thought our war was immoral. Mm -hmm. Not just a mistake or, right. or too costly, but a, immoral. And more than 70% mm -hmm. thought, it, thought it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. In the decades since the war, there has been a broad effort in government, but also in, in I think, corporate life and mm -hmm. in, the, in the major media to kind of repackage the, the war in a way that's much more palatable to, to us. Mm -hmm. And the way, they've, the way that's happened really is to try to transform the war into an American tragedy so that we think less or, or forget about what we did in and to Vietnam and focus instead on the damage it, it did or the purported damage mm -hmm. uh, it did to us and our culture and our politics. And so Reagan, for ex President Reagan in the 80s would, would say that um, there had been, uh, the war had damaged our pride, our patriotism, and, and most importantly our power. Mm -hmm. And all of that had to be uh, res restored. And right. we had to undergo a kind of national rebuilding process and, yeah. and, and a healing process, too. Right, uh, but he didn't say, he said that the war is if the war happened to us, not as if right, yes. we committed, yes. you know, we well, you started know, the war. Jimmy Carter, it must be uh -huh. said, in the 1970s was asked, do you think we should um, give some aid and even reparations to Vietnam to help them rebuild from sure. this devastating war? Mm -hmm. And his answer was, no, I, I don't think... Um, we should because the, the, the damage was mutual, as, as if there had been a proportionate mm -hmm. you know, uh, loss. Um, right. So, um, yeah, it, I have a chapter in the, in the book called Victim Nation, mm -hmm. and I, I really do believe in the years and decades since the war, we have more and more thought of ourselves uh, as a victim of these really inexplicable foreign forces that mm -hmm. are uh, frequently committing these kind of hate crimes yeah. against us for, for, for no reason we, uh, we can uh, understand. And there's a reason why I think the public d doesn't understand a lot of this, and that's mm -hmm. because for decades, um, especially starting with the Cold War, the government has been engaged in all kinds of interventions, many of them secret mm -hmm. to, to us, yeah. not secret in these foreign places, to overthrow governments or mm -hmm. to intervene in ways that really creates disorder and, and animosity toward us. Sure. And then you, sometimes, decades later, there is what the CIA calls this blowback, mm -hmm. the unintended consequences of these secret policies. Right. The classic example being the Iran hostage crisis mm -hmm. of 79 to 81. Mm -hmm. And ag again, I think that helped uh, set the kind of template for us thinking of ourselves a, 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 as a victim, and mm -hmm. that Vietnam had also victimized us. And um, one of the, the, vic the sort of the most classic examples of uh, victimization was the way in which the image of the American Vietnam veteran mm -hmm. was transformed in the years afterward. And uh, I think, I, I mean, I, I know I've had many generations of students who have, have somehow gotten the idea growing up yeah. that the most shameful thing about the Vietnam War has nothing to do with the war itself mm -hmm. or, or even that we lost, mm -hmm. uh, but the shabby treatment of um, Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is, of course, uh, they were treated horribly, I, I would argue, but the chief abuser, of course, was, was the government, right. in my view, for, yes. first of all, lying to them about 
the origins of the war and what right. was going on there, sending them in a place where they were mm -hmm. widely perceived as foreign invaders, not mm -hmm. liberators, and then when they came home, not offering them the kind of benefits and mm -hmm. services that, that, that they des deserved and needed. And needed, too, yeah. Right. And, and one other thing to point out is that a lot of them were there because they were drafted. Mm -hmm. They did not choose to right. go. Um, right. they, they didn't right. sign up. Yeah, I would say about yeah, one third were drafted, another mm -hmm. third were what the military even itself calls draft-induced. That mm -hmm. is, they knew it was inevitable that they're going to be drafted, so they yeah. quote, quote, unquote, volunteered right. to try to get a better deal. But, um, yeah. Yes, that, that is f for sure. And, but, mm -hmm. uh, e so even though, and, and, and corporate America yeah. didn't do anything like as much as they should to hire and train vets, uh, mm -hmm. in part because there, there were these terrible media stereotypes in the 70s mm -hmm. of um, vets as wacko, drug addled, violence prone, mm -hmm. uh, and even traditional veterans organizations like the American Legion and be, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars didn't really reach out a welcoming mm -hmm. hand to vets. But given all that, yeah. We're um, the the image of the chief abusers that sort of comes out in our culture is this I idea. It was the anti-war movement, right? That w was the most abusive of Vietnam veterans, mm -hmm. and this whole set of stories about protesters lining up at airports and greeting returning veterans with, uh, uh, you know, sp calling them baby killers or uh, literally even spitting on them mm -hmm. has become a part of our post-war. M memory and I, I, I think um, these stories are at least wildly exaggerated, mm -hmm. if not entirely invented. And I, right. and I do think there was some tension between um, many veterans uh, who were understandably resentful yeah. of that portion of the generation uh, that could go to college and go on with mm -hmm. their lives. And um, many felt that the anti war movement was kind of sanctimonious and self righteous, and they felt that somehow they, they were. Um, being found immoral, mm -hmm. anti-war protesters would then reply, "No, actually, we're really blaming the, uh, you know, the, the, the generals and the presidents, not who sent the you there, you know, yeah. But there, there, there certainly right. was uh, some mm -hmm. tension. But what gets forgot the, the, pro the problem with these stories is that it, first of all, it demonizes this very vibrant and di very diverse anti-war movement. It wasn't just mm -hmm. campus-based; there were yeah. every religious group, older mm -hmm. people, you know." <laughs> Grandmothers yeah. for Peace. Absolutely, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, yeah the whole music the culture, business, everything. Uh, even mean. business finally turned against, uh, against yeah. the war. But um, so it demonizes the uh, mm -hmm. an important movement for peace, mm -hmm. and it also helps us forget, which we should never forget, that many veterans themselves came to oppose the war, mm -hmm. and by the by the end of the war, they, they were really leading the anti-war movement. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this, so. Um, that's another kind of memory that I'm trying to recover mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in, in the book because I think um, veterans, uh, you know, have continued mm -hmm. in the years since to be important critics of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And just as a quick aside, when normalization with Vietnam finally came in the 1990s, mm -hmm. the, the media had this image uh, that veterans were opposed to it until there was really a true full accounting of all American missing in action. Mm -hmm. and, and, s and some vets said that. But um, other vets were at the forefront of pushing for normalized relations because they were, many of them, trying to establish true reconciliation mm -hmm. by establishing all kinds of collaborative um, NGOs and independent mm -hmm. projects with, uh, you know, their counterpart um, veterans, but yes. also with artists and filmmakers mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, health workers. Mm -hmm. Uh, projects to clean up the land from unexploded ordnance. I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of an uh, extraordinary uh, untold story. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of them, I mean, they went there as 18-year-olds because they were drafted or talked into, you know, um, in, enlisting. I think that once they got there and realized that we, we started to question what we were doing there, I started to question what we were even told were the reasons that we were there, that um, that they, even for their own peace of mind, needed to make some reconciliation. Right, and, and many have yeah. gone back uh, to Vietnam, mm -hmm. you know, even just as tourists. And mm -hmm. uh, without exception, the, the people I've talked to who have gone mm -hmm. have found it very cathartic to mm -hmm. see the country at peace and to meet people. And, yeah. and the Vietnamese have been extremely welcoming to mm -hmm. American uh, 
uh, American visitors. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what, I mean, we were, we, the American public was told, you know, about the domino theory, the idea of, you know, mm -hmm. communism sort of basically taking over the, wor the, um, the, the world. Um, but, but what was the real reason we were there? Yeah, that's a very important question because mm -hmm. while I do believe the uh, Eisenhower and Kennedy be believed fervently in, in the domino theory, by the mid 60s, mm -hmm. it, it's quite clear from the, the record, which was, of course, classified at the time, mm -hmm. and the public didn't know about that um, policymakers really were no longer so concerned about losing Vietnam to communism. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were some amazing uh, memos written within the Pentagon and back and forth uh, in government that said, one in particular I'm quoting almost exactly, mm -hmm. whatever reasons got us into Vietnam are now merely academic. Mm -hmm. The only reason we remain in Vietnam is to quote, avoid humiliation. Mm -hmm. In other words, to preserve appearances uh, and uh, uh, our, uh, the appearance being that we are a strong and resolute country, that we're not a paper tiger, that we don't abandon our commitments, that mm -hmm. we will never surrender, uh, that um, withdrawal would be seen as um, intolerably, an intolerable sign of uh, international weakness. Mm -hmm. And I think the opposite is true. I think if, if uh, Johnson had had the moral courage to withdraw, our credibility around the world actually would have Im improved our reputation. Yeah. And even an, uh, a more narrow concern, which was very important to Johnson, is political concern. I mean, because yeah. he thought it would be politically, personally, politically terrible yeah. for him to withdraw, because he mm -hmm. remembered so vividly how the Republicans had uh, gone after Truman back in the uh, early 50s for quote unquote losing China mm -hmm. to communism. Uh, in fact, uh, I think his political future might have been saved by pull, pulling out. Um, mm -hmm. and so it's just ironic, you know, this yeah. master politician uh, uh -huh. couldn't quite see how profound that the discontent mm -hmm. was. Right, because when he was running, when his actual first election, I mean, when yeah. he was uh, running as opposed to appointed, uh, the he, he kind of changed the focus. We only have a minute or so, but um, yeah. in this last minute we have, can you sort of talk to us a little bit about what, happ what happened in 1965 that sort of, he, when he changed the focus of us defending them as yeah, opposed to us I mean, defending having ourselves? Yeah, I run effectively mm -hmm. as a kind of peace candidate in 64 saying yeah. he would never send American boys 10,000 miles away from home to fight a war, that mm -hmm. these boys should fight. By early 65, it was clear from the advice he was getting that if he did not, massively escalate the war, mm -hmm. the uh, government in South Vietnam would collapse, mm -hmm. if, if not in weeks, maybe months. And so uh, he uh, understood that the, the bet that it wouldn't necessarily achieve the objective right. of a permanent non-communist South Vietnam that didn't rely on our massive support, but he, he was convinced that he could at least avert defeat. Mm -hmm. And so that that really explains this massive escalation. No great mm -hmm. confidence that we were going to go in there and get the job done yeah. and create a, a broadly supported government, but yeah. just that it would prevent defeat. Right. And that, that really right. explains it. And then he also, at, at some point, um, 1964 or 1965, said uh, American ships have been fired, torpedoed. Yes. And so now we were right. suddenly defending ourselves, yeah, not yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, that's a very good point. That was yeah. the, the so-called Gulf of Tonkin incident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A couple of tiny uh, North Vietnamese patrol boats w uh, uh, did, w on one occasion, fire uh, some torpedoes. They missed. Okay. There was no, no American casualties. But mm -hmm. the, the key uh, factor is that uh, he said it was unprovoked. We had actually yeah. been waging a secret war for three years against them. Yes, exactly, right. Well, uh, I really want to thank you for being with us. We I'm are out of time at this yeah, point. Thanks. Thank you for being with us. You've been watching Behind the Pages from the staff of 22 City View. I'm Diane Goshgarian. Thank you. That's such a fascinating, it's such a fascinating subject. Like I said, having grown up with a lot of it, and then by the time I reached college, actually yeah. participating in some of the anti-war movements and demonstrations. and.